everyone. Welcome to day two of Career Bootcamp 2024, where you will learn how to elevate your career to new heights. Please note that this session will be offered in English and French simultaneously. To view the French session, please return to the Zoom lobby and join the French session. I will be your moderator today. My name is Julia. I am a woman who uses she, her pronouns. I have medium length, dark brown to black hair with brown eyes, and I'm wearing a white knitted sweater today. I have been working in science policy since starting my federal public service career in 2021, and I currently work as a policy analyst at the Department of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development. I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Ag 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 sorry, <laughs> An Anishabe people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since uh, time memorial, and I encourage all of you to acknowledge the land that you're on as well. Career Boot Camp is the largest conference in the government of Canada, and the only goal is to support you in your career journey. As we move through today's session, please share your questions by using the Q&A button in the language of your choice. You can vote for questions you like by clicking on the thumbs up button. Please ensure as much as possible that your questions are related to the topic of today's discussion. If you are looking for answers on additional topics, you can find resources, including links to session recordings and podcasts on the FIN wiki page under resources. As with all FIN sessions, this session will be recorded, so you can go back to check out the recordings and the insights at a later date. In addition to the recordings on our YouTube channel, we are also offering another way to learn this year, a podcast series of the Career Bootcamp sessions. After CBC, the podcast will be made available on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We would also like to note that the PowerPoint sessions um, for each session is included on our Wiki page so that you can feel free to follow along at your own rate and to improve your learning experience. Also, all the resources shared during the session will be added to our Wiki page under resources. So I'm very much looking forward to learning alongside you today, which brings me to the learning objectives. The goal today is to learn how to reframe rejection as a learning opportunity and recognize the sphere of influence, to better manage emotions and cope with disappointment while remaining focused on future goals, and to maintain a positive attitude and stay motivated and proactively pursue new opportunities within your control. So before we begin, we'd like to get a sense of your experience with rejection in the workplace through a couple of polling questions. This is not a test, it's not mandatory, but you are encouraged to participate, which will be anonymous. So we have our first polling question, which is, have you ever experienced job rejection in your career journey? There's three options. Yes, it was a valuable uh, learning experience. B, yes, and it was challenging to cope with. C, no, I haven't faced rejection yet. The second question is, when you face a job rejection, what's your initial response? Are you A, uh, do you reflect on what you can learn and how to improve? B, feel disappointed, but try to move on quickly. C, find it demotivating and struggle to stay positive. Or D, get defensive and look for ways to appeal the decision. So take a moment to reflect and submit um, your answers. We have a little bit more time until we share the results. All right. Okay, so the first question, have you ever experienced job rejection in your career journey? Um, the majority said yes, and it was challenging to cope with. Um, with the second most popular was yes, and it was a valuable learning experience. Um, and those both can be true at the same time, right? Um, the second question, when you face a job rejection, what's your initial response? Um so the response that received the most votes was that you feel disappointed, but you try to move on quickly. Um, and then uh, a little split between that reflecting on, on what you can learn and how to improve, um, as well as, you know, feeling demotivated and, and struggling to stay positive. 
uh, but no initial defensiveness. <laughs> um, so all your feelings are are valid. Um, and this session will will reaffirm that really and hopefully teach you just some new ways to process and frame your emotions. So I'd like to now introduce our panelists who we are fortunate enough to have with us today. Um, our first panelist is Andrew. He uses uh, he, him pronouns. He is a neuroscientist by training and currently an assistant director of the Behavioral Insights and Experimentation Team at Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. He is passionate about social impact research, equity, systems change, mentorship, and community building. Our second panelist is Jose, who uses he, him pronouns. He is a young professional with five years of federal and provincial government experience. Jose currently serves as a technical marketer at the Canadian Digital Service within the Treasury Board Secretariat. Uh, if you mind just, thank you, switching that slide there. Jose is passionate about com uh, compassionate self-growth and the empowerment of youth through mentorship. And our third panelist is Taya, who uses she, her pronouns. She has over 15 years of professional government experience. Taya is currently a communication specialist for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and she is passionate about community building, globe trotting, and the color turquoise. So I'll now actually be handing it over to Taya, who will begin the presentation by talking about how to identify emotions. Um, and then Jose will later discuss the sphere of control, followed by Andrew, who will focus on actions within our control. And then we will open it up to audience questions. So over to you, Taya. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julia. So, so just to describe myself, I am an incredibly beautiful woman with no, <laughs> could you imagine if I did that? To honestly describe myself, I have blonde hair just below my shoulders, blue eyes. I'm a woman. I'm wearing a black blazer and I'm 39 years old. So I got a lot of setbacks to talk about, but I'm going to choose one just for the sake of time. So today we're going to discuss the will of emotions and how we can go from experiencing some of those difficult, challenging emotions like feeling sad or mad or scared in the most productive and healthy of ways um, so that we can once again start to feel some of those emotions that feel really good inside of our bodies. Emotions like feeling peaceful or a sense of having power in your life or feeling joy. And so I'm going to share with you my biggest setback and how it impacted my life both personally and professionally. So in 2016, I was going about my life, doing my thing, having a good time. Um, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, my mom, who was one of my best friends in life, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and given four months to live. Shortly after she passed away, my grandmother, who was like this amazing woman and like a second parent to me, passed away unexpectedly. And a year after that, my dad was told that his cancer had spread to his bones and he didn't have much time left. So yeah, I was in a pretty dark place for sure. And I think I experienced every single emotion on the more challenging side of this will uh, that we're talking about today. And I started to feel myself disengaging from my career and from my personal life. And so I did as someone does when they're experiencing uncomfortable feelings, I tried to run. So I would pack my day full of distractions to the point where I was mowing the grass at 11 o'clock at night and putting up a very inappropriate number of string lights throughout my backyard garden. Because surely if I could light up my external world, somehow I could light up my internal world. Much to my dismay, I realized that I couldn't run from those feelings because unfortunately, they follow you everywhere you go. So I had to face them head on and process them. And it's through that journey, which I'm still on, by the way, continuing to learn and evolve in that way, 
but I learned the power of the questions that we ask ourselves. And now oftentimes when we're going through a setback in our career or our personal life, we ask ourselves questions like, why me? Like, why does this happen to me? Why do I never get the jobs or the promotions? Why do I always get the boring work? Why does my boss hate me? Whatever question it might be. And those questions just suck us further into the quicksand and leave us stagnant in our lives. Whereas if we ask ourselves different types of questions, like, oh man, I'm really in a funk. Like, how can I get out of this? How can I get the help that I need and I want? You know, what resources are available to me out there? And how can I create the life and career that I truly want and deserve? Those types of questions are action-oriented, solution-based questions, and they are game changers. And Mel Robbins, who is this, if anyone knows her, she's a best-selling author and a podcaster, and she has this great exercise that she does with her clients. And she says, take out a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, and in your mind, think of a point in your life when you were happiest. And for the sake of this, we could say when you were most fulfilled in your career. And on the left-hand side, write down what your day-to-day -day activities looked like, who you surrounded yourself with, and what your daily habits were. And on the right-hand side, do the same thing, but for your current reality. And all of a sudden, just like this, we can automatically see a bridge from where we are right now to how we can get back to our roots of what truly made us happy as people and as professionals in our career. And I know we're limited on time here and I could go on forever because I feel very passionate about this subject. Um, but I leave you with this. I promise you, if you ask yourself good questions, it will change your life in the most beautiful of ways. I know it certainly has for me. So thank you so much for having me here today and allowing me this time. And uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Jose so I don't take uh, up any of his time. Thank you, Taya. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose. I'm a Latino man with short, wavy hair. I'm currently wearing a striped button-up shirt with orange and white stripes. Taya, thank you so much for that wonderful share. I really appreciated how you touched on the importance of asking yourself questions. And at the core, separate identifying what to do next after facing something like rejection from a job or rejection in general is fundamental to moving forward. And the model I personally have found really useful is something we call circles of control, which are made up of these. You see them on your screen. And on the outside and the furthest circle are the things you can't control. In the, in the middle, in this nebulous area, are what we call the sphere of influence. And these are and, and these are the things we can indirectly affect or sway through our actions and relationships. I'm going to dive into some examples in just a bit. And where we should always start when trying to find our footing, to when trying to determine what to do next, is that sphere of control. The things you can directly do to work towards that outcome that you might seek. I'll share, I'll share a quick story about when this came most in handy for me. When I graduated from university in 2021, I was lucky that I went straight into a role here in the public service at the Canadian Digital Service. Back then I was focusing on managing events for our organization. And after having done that for some time, I found myself at a crossroads where I was struggling to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And what they don't teach you in university is when you once you graduate, it's really within your control to start paving that path forward for yourself. And maybe, you know, many of you might still be in university. Many of you may have recently graduated. If you're feeling this way, know that it is, that one, it is normal. I feel most people go through this realization at some point. And two, that it, understand that it will take time 
for you to find, you know, for you to find that direction. And that is the privilege of self-actualization. We have the, a lot of us have the privilege of choice and that can be a little bit overwhelming. Our spheres of control, determining what's within our control to go towards that can be really helpful in, in starting to make progress, whether it be, again, bouncing back from a rejection or just determining what it is that you might want to do next. Some of the things within our control include learning from learning from your experience, the reputation that you build with others through your actions, through your work ethic. In the context of government processes, that includes the, how prepared you are for the process itself. One I would recommend you always start with is your self-care, especially if you've been rejected from a job. It can be really challenging. It's important that you allow yourself to feel those emotions. And Taya provide you with a great framework on how to do that. By taking care of this first, you are setting yourself up to succeed in everything that follows. Another one I really like personally is professional development. Even if even if your role perhaps is not as fulfilling as you might want it to be, and you're looking to make a change, the government does provide with many professional development opportunities, including events like this. And you might even have a professional development budget. I, what I love about professional development is it enables you to try something new at minimal risk. You know, let's say you do communications and you might want to dive into marketing or bring that into your role. Can hit, I did that myself. It Professional development enabled me to learn what marketing was without leaving my role in communications. Uh, I could go on and on, but we are limited on time. To touch on the sphere of influence, again, these are the things you can indirectly control. Things like your professional network, who you choose to connect with, how you build those relationships and the reputation that you build. While you don't have direct control of how people perceive you, you can, you do have control on putting your best foot forward. And, and kind of tying into that is also building your personal brand. What what kind of per, what kind of work or leader collaborator do you want people to think of you as? backing those up with backing those up with actions can enable folks to develop the right perspective about you uh, next slide please oh. now, yeah can we go to just the next slide uh, past the bubbles perfect one thing that you also need to understand about government is that timing is outside of your control on the right is a wonderful graphic that shows what the entire hiring process looks like from start to finish. It is 75 steps long. Government, because of the processes it needs to follow, will intrinsically take longer to hire folks. Some folks have been in pools for multiple months, if not multiple years. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, is my suggestion. You can minimize risks by applying to more pools, by looking, by even looking at other roles in other departments. Crown corporations offer great opportunities. There's economists. The government being so large, it is full of opportunities for you to try something new. And so don't try, you know, if some if you don't hear back, know that there are so many factors, including things like the process itself. That make it that can make it really challenging to hear back immediately. And I know that the waiting can be really, really tough. To wrap up, I want to I want to leave you with an idea. One of the most wonderful things government provides us is work-life balance. I always encourage folks to explore interests outside of work. Myself, I lead tours uh, for international. I lead tours of international students with international students across the U.S. and Canada in my free time. I personally really enjoy it, and it really does fill my cup. The work-life balance that government provides me enables me to organize these events outside of my work hours and on weekends. So, ten out of ten recommend. You know, if you have a hobby, if you have a passion, a business you might want to start, definitely pursue that outside of work because we do have this privilege of work-life balance. To, to conclude, 
I'm sure you all have heard the phrase, the world is your oyster. But what people don't know is what the entire phrase actually says. It's from a Shakespeare play called The Mayor Whites of Windsor. And the full phrase says, the world's mine oyster, which I would sword will open. It's up to you to decide and empower yourself to bounce back from rejection and build that life that you want. So with that, I will pass it to Andrew. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Taya. Uh, excellent, excellent job, both of you. So to start, I'm a uh, man with short black hair, uh, white Middle Eastern, bushy eyebrows, bit of a beard and dark sweater on. And uh, I'm delighted to talk to you today. You know, when I first started as a public servant a few years ago, I always felt like there was secret information that I just didn't have access to. And over time, I learned and developed a community and learned from others. And I'm just excited to be able to do that for all of you today as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, a specific example where you can take action after going through a rejection process. Now, the one thing I want to mention, though, is that I do not re recommend starting actions like this until you have kind of taken some time to process that loss, just like Taya was mentioning and Jose was mentioning. So these things I'm going to talk about today, only do this once you have accepted this loss, whether it's a specific you know, email rejection from a process, you've been looked over for an acting assignment or a assignment, anything like that. Once you have stopped digging in and asking yourself questions like, how did this happen? That's when we can start with the actions. So the slide we're looking at is a table with a uh, blue row at the top with headings action. And some of the actions listed here are identify pools I can qualify for, apply for multiple pools, and have answers validated. What's most important in terms of taking action are a couple of things. So I think of this in terms of gardening. I like to garden, and I think it's a really easy analogy. When you want to grow, you know, let's say you want to grow some carrots in your garden or something like this. Do you just plant one plant and expect it to make a lot of carrots? Or do you plant a lot of different plants, right? Some of the plants might not grow very well. So you want to make sure you have a lot of opportunities in process to profit from in the future. The other thing is that carrots don't grow overnight. They take time. You got to water them every day. You got to take care of them. So in other words, you got to take a lot of small actions over time to, you know, eventually enjoy whatever salad you're going to make with these carrots or just eat them raw, whatever. So let's think about this now in terms of these opportunities. When you're thinking about, you know, you know, a rejection you receive and you're thinking like, oh my gosh, how can I, you know, I was really expecting to get that job. How can I move forward now? Best kind of advice I would give to you is break your goals down into very small goals. So we call this SMART goals. So SMART stands for goals that are specific, they're measurable, they are achievable, and they are relevant to you. And they're also bound in time. So we can think of that first row there of identify pools I qualify for as really specific, it's measurable, you can do this kind of on your own time by looking at GC jobs, asking colleagues, and just think about what current pools exist for, in this case, AS1, might be a different classification for you. What pools I actually qualify for? Look them up on GC Jobs. Save the posting as a PDF. That's a really small step that you can do that will move you one step closer to your goal of getting into an actual AS1 pool. So in that process, think about who can support you in this action. You can reach out to existing networks in Government of Canada. You can ask your boss, potentially your mentor, your colleagues, um, for advice on what existing pools uh, are available to you. Maybe some are in your department or agency. And then in this next column, obstacles to completing the action. Brainstorm a bit about what could get in your way. So thinking about identifying these pools, even taking a step back, do I have time to do this? 
maybe it's not something you want to do right away. Maybe this is a goal you want to set for yourself for in the next two weeks. I want a list of the possible pools I want to apply for. And then think about, you know, can I control the influence of this obstacle? In general, yes, you can give yourself more time to navigate the system. You can think about creatively what experience you have and how it applies to the pool. And also identify what tools or resources you can use to help yourself. The thing is, though, is you don't want to take on too many of these goals at the same time, right? You don't want to just expect this plant of yours, this carrot of yours to grow overnight. So you want to do all these little steps kind of one after the other. So first look at the pools, right? And then next you might think about, okay, I'm seeing all the merit criteria for all these pools. They're all kind of similar. Maybe I can look at each of the merit criteria individually and start to just brainstorm bullet point notes about how I address each of them with my past experiences. Start writing brief stories about things you've done in the past in your jobs and how it demonstrates you meet each of these criteria. In the process of that, if there is a merit criteria that you don't meet, think about how you can bring this forward to your manager and say, hey, I want to get experience doing this specific task. And then your manager can actively support you in your goals. You can get the experience you need and move forward in your goal. I admit it in a very small way, but these are not like objectives that you are going to be able to achieve in like a couple of weeks time. These are kind of like what you think of as like infinite objectives, right? Like your infinite objective is to grow in your career. Your finite objective is to get the next promotion. And it's all relevant. All of these little micro steps are going to be helping you all along the way. So just to close here, I would just say that I've described these things in terms of, you know, things you could do to apply for a pool and, uh, you know, get into a pool like this. Remember to reach out to your colleagues, reach out to even your community on social media if you feel comfortable doing that. There are so many great and supportive people in the government of uh, Canada that are so willing to provide some time, you know, give you some advice, look at your CV, give you a bit of tips, you know. And I just want to share that, like, you know, you, your perspective, you might think like everyone else has it figured out. I'm the only one that keeps getting rejected from pools. I'm the only one that can't get promoted, right? And I will just share with you, like all the way up to the EX level, we are all still trying to figure it out. We are still all applying to these like epic, complex, kind of broken hiring processes, all trying to do our best. And so just keep that in mind. We're all dealing with rejection all the time. And so what matters for you is to think about how you can overcome it in these small ways by giving yourself time to take these small actions and also creating multiple opportunities for yourself for success. So don't just set up one information interview with someone that you kind of know, maybe set up five and see how their answers differed or were similar. Don't just apply to one pool, apply to like five different ones. Even if they're not your quote unquote dream job, you might just find that you're interested in, in the end or just doing the process was a good experience for you. So that's what I will leave with you uh, today. There is a worksheet that you see here available on the FIN page. And I would just say that take these proactive steps and be flexible in your plans. And even being here for the session is one of those steps and getting this information. Thank you. Passing it now to Julia for the Q&A. Thanks, Andrew. And thank you all for that wonderful presentation. I resonated with a lot of what was said and I've already learned a lot. So I'm excited to learn more uh, through your responses to our audience questions, which we will now move to. Uh, just a reminder, you can use the Q&A function to submit your questions and you can vote for the questions that you like by using the thumbs up. And we'll go through them based on the most votes. Um, I think actually like each of you have responded to some of these questions in some ways, but uh, We'll still, uh, we'll still look at them and uh, maybe you'll have some new uh, insights. So let's start with the first one. Um, I feel like, Andrew, you kind of just touched on some of this, but uh, a lot of people are, are interested uh, about how they can identify points of improvement. So especially if employers are not able or willing to provide feedback, how do they know what they're supposed to improve on? Um what are some resources available to work on things like improving your CV or your cover letter 
um, or, you know, things like that, that can get you that next job? So this is a very good question. I think the first thing I would share is that in Government of Canada, thankfully, most hiring managers, depending on what stage you were screened out of, are willing to give you some feedback. That feedback might be very generic, not very helpful, but it's a start. Others will give more feedback and more detail, which is great. But let's say they don't give any and you just don't know what happened. Let's say you got um, screened out in the early phases or you did an interview and you didn't proceed to references. There's a couple of things you can look into. So the first thing I would do is use the stage at which you were screened out as data. But just keep in mind that it's a single data point. So what do I mean by that? You know, if you were screened out, obviously that means they read your CV and your screening questions and you did not match the criteria. So it's possible that number one, you don't have the experience. It's also possible that they misinterpreted what you wrote and they thought or perceived you to not be matching the experiences. It's really hard to do a objective perception of your own self sometimes. So I find it helps to ask a colleague to just say, hey, here's what I submitted for this job. Here's what the posting looked like. Um, I think I match it. Can you just have a look and let me know where I think I'm not really putting my best foot forward? Sometimes it's just a matter of using the right words and describing your experiences. Sometimes it's a matter of using the right approach where you want to have, you know, talk about what actions you took, what was the result using the STAR method and kind of describing your experiences. You might not level up entirely in the first couple of applications, but again, this is an infinite kind of game, right? It's all about gradual improvement over time. Each application you make is going to get better and better. Um, and so that's what I would recommend. Um, and to not think about this as like one application or nothing, to think about all of this as a continual learning process. Thank you. Atea, it looks like you might have a response to that as well. Oh, I was just going to add to what Andrew said, like, sometimes it seems so counterintuitive as well. But like, sometimes you have to literally say word for word that you have this, like, you know, if they, it would depending on the qualifications, but if it's like, I am an English speaking Canadian citizen with a university degree, like it seems really counterintuitive to say something like that. Um, but if that's what they are asking for, sometimes you have to use those exact words. And um, which always feels weird to me, but it's also government. So it's a bit more bureaucratic, right? Because they have a checklist on their end where they're just like, okay, yeah, they've stated it, check. Um, and then obviously when you're providing like job examples and stuff, you have to say you have it, but then you also have to say how you have it, when you had it, like whatever, that kind of detailed information as, as well. Before I move to Jose, maybe I'll just add to this question because both of you are, are speaking to kind of like these pools and these formal uh, selection processes. But I'm kind of curious what about for people that are looking to move up in their kind of current team and maybe their managers telling them they're not ready for that promotion. There are departments that have like development programs. Um, so as long as you meet those competencies, you can move forward. But if you're just being told, like, it's not the right time, but you're not really told on what you need to improve on, that can be really challenging. So maybe I'll just add that in, but I'll move to Jose um, for, to, for you to respond. It was just to add to Taya's and Andrew's comments, plus, plus, plus one to what Taya mentioned about you explicitly including the wording from the position from advice that I've received from recruiters and other HR professionals, even synonyms that sound like what the position includes can get you screened out. So a tool I personally like to use, and I've just put included it in the chat, is job scan. Here you can upload or you can copy and paste the position and you can upload your resume and it'll tell you um, how well your resume has incorporated all the keywords from the position. You can work with this to start increasing the percentage match, which hopefully means that your resume doesn't get, that you reduce the, the chance that your resume gets screened out. 
That sounds like a very useful tool. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Are we happy to move on to the next question? Okay, fantastic. So um, this attendee wrote that they find it hard to network with professionals in their industry, and they're looking for some basic steps to just start building a network and how that can help with job rejections. Um, maybe I will pass it to Taya, if that's all right. Yeah, so... I was just going to say, like, I remember when I was um, fresh out of university and starting my career, I also found it very awkward to network, you know, because I envisioned it like you had to go schmooze your way around a room where you didn't know anyone and start small talk. And that never really resonated with me, like just as a person. And so I think it's important to acknowledge what types of events or networking opportunities feel right to you. And if it if it doesn't, then that's okay. Um, there will be others that feel more natural to you. That being said, it, it's kind of a dichotomy, but there are also, you know, you do also have to put yourself out there, out of your comfort zone. Um, and that will allow you to build that confidence and that experience in doing it. And that's the only way you can kind of make it feel a bit more comfortable it is by doing it. Um, so I think too, you could come with like a set of questions, think in advance, what are some questions that you could ask people when you run into them and it seems awkward at first, um, some conversation starters, so stuff like that, that just, again, helps you feel a bit more comfortable in those situations. Um, I'm just looking at some notes that I wrote down here. Also saying yes to things um, in terms of building your network, like when opportunities come around, I remember initially, like I just said yes to everything because I'm just like, it's experience. It's like new tools, new assets in the bag so that when that career or job comes up that you really want, you can say, yes, I've done it. I've done it. Right. Um, so say yes to opportunities, even if you don't feel a hundred percent equipped to do them because no one is like, I think that's the thing. No one, even the executives, they apply for executive positions and they're like, I don't have everything, but I'm going to give it a shot and I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn by doing right. So oftentimes we sell ourselves short and we just say, we don't have absolutely everything. Therefore we're not perfect and we can't apply. And I would say, don't do that to yourself, like apply and have faith that, that you can do the job if you are hired, because you will naturally learn to do the job. Um, so I would say that that helps too in networking and building those communities. Thank you. And Andrew, it looks like you have something to add as well. Yeah, thanks. A um, couple things. First, I would say, um, as someone who used to say yes to everything, I would just say a bit of an amendment, say yes to the right things. Learn to say no to some things, just, just a small amendment. Avoid burnout that way. Um, a bit of advice on networking. And I'm gonna just say upfront, I think this is gonna resonate with some of the people on the call, perhaps not all of them. I'm gonna speak from the perspective of a regional public servant who was fired um, at the time I lived in Toronto, now I live in Montreal. I don't live in Ottawa. I can't go to networking events. I can't go to big meetings. I can't go to town halls. So I can't do all those things. But one thing I, I kind of fell into was social media networking. And I think that like, you know, maybe you love social media, maybe you hate social media. I think regardless of your feeling about it, it is a necessary tool to grow your career in 2024. Maybe it's LinkedIn these days. Maybe it was X or Twitter a couple of years ago, but I have found that being um, getting connected to so many cool, like-minded public servants at totally different stages of their career in different departments or agencies is so invaluable. And not just in a way where it's like a one-to-one -one linear connection of like, oh, I network with this person and it led to this job. It's a lot more kind of like postmodern in a style where it's like, oh, these loose diffuse connections actually give me more diffuse connections in the future. And that's valuable for these other reasons. Maybe I don't know how it's valuable today, but in a year from now, I will get some more information or I will access something that I didn't have access to before. So you might be wondering, how do I network on social media? I think there's a few different ways to go about it. 
the most basic passive of ways like to just adapt your LinkedIn profile so that the right stuff shows on your on your feed and start commenting on cool posts. Start interacting with people, just saying like, hey, this resonates with me as a X role in this place. I see similar problems where I am. Would love to chat about this sometime. You could also think about, let's say you're dealing with a cool kind of project that not a lot of people have access to. Like in my case, it was, I was doing research at public health on the COVID-19 pandemic. So I started posting a little bit about what was that experience like for me? And that allowed me to grow my kind of community people working in similar emergency scenarios, different things. I just connected with them on that. The third way is to just reach out to people on direct message LinkedIn. The thing I would say, though, is that there is a right way to do this and a wrong way, I would say. The right way to do it, the wrong way to do it is not to just say, hey, I would love to connect some time. You know, people are most likely to get a lot of these messages and it's hard to parse. Always have a specific goal in mind. Just say like, hey, I find your career trajectory really inspiring and it's similar to what I'm going through right now. Would you be able to chat with me for 15 or 30 minutes so I could just learn a bit about what your experiences were like? If I see something like that, I am way more likely to say like, hey, let's chat this week. Like, let's, you know, share information. And those are a few ways in which you can go about it. And I would just strongly encourage you, especially regional employees, to take advantage of this because it's hard enough to get ahead in our careers as regional employees. So you really have to use all these tools. Thanks, Andrew. I'll just say that Ian, one of our attendees, has given your Twitter a shout out in the Q&A box saying that you have some pretty epic and engaging convos about uh, professional development on Twitter. So a little plug there. <laughs> Everyone follow Andrew. Thank you for that response. Jose, over to you. To, to add to both Taya's and Andrew's point, uh, I really appreciate approach when people approach reaching out to me with a goal. And the way I would reframe that slightly to make it seem a little bit less daunting is to approach every conversation with curiosity. To Taya's earlier point, I, I so. And when I started by working, I felt in a similar position. I need to go schmooze that I, this was that every transaction, that every interaction felt transactional. And I think we're just conditioned to approach their working this way. Uh, uh, a good colleague of mine once told me instead of approaching conversations, trying to get something out of them, just approach them with a question. What are you actually generally curious to learn about this person? And when you center your goal on that, it just makes that interaction so, flow so much more naturally. At least it did for me. And two, as, as another, as a regional employee as well, I'm based out of Toronto. One of the things I enjoy the most is being able to connect with folks outside of the public service. N it enabled me not just to learn of new and different approaches to trying things, which I can bring into my own work, but also you as a public servant in in an environment that's further, you know, kind of outside of the public service bubble, have a really unique perspective to bring to folks in other institutions, whether it be the provincial, provincial or municipal government, whether it be folks in the, in the non-for-profit space. I, I often talk with people, I'm personally interested in product management, which is a discipline um, in the digital transformation field. And here in Toronto, there are so many tech companies that I get to speak with a lot of other people that do product management in the context of private sector. And we get to compare notes on how and on how the structures of government make it, fun, make it fundamentally different. And I found that that exposure has really enriched me in a whole in a much different way than when I was still studying in Ottawa and kind of seeing all, all the same people all, all the time that are kind of working within the same constraints. So if you are a regional employee, take advantage of that exposure to find, to bring in new ways of doing things into your own work. Thank you all. Oh, Taya. Sorry. I was just, I was just going to say too, um, sometimes networking can just be very natural as well and authentic, right? Like that's the best kind of networking is like you, you're launching a new program or you're, you know, you're kickstarting something in the office. Typically you need approvals, right? So you're going to naturally network and form those relationships with those people in the process. And you're also going to attract 
you know, typically like-minded people who are interested and passionate about the same kind of work you are. So sometimes you don't have to go seek it out. Sometimes you can also attract it um, by being like ferociously pursuing work that you're really passionate about. Thank you for that addition and for each of you for sharing your perspectives on networking. Uh, it is a very challenging thing to do, especially early, early on in your career. Um, I'm going to go to our next uh, most upvoted question, which is what can I do if I keep getting rejected for jobs that I really want? Uh, like, how do I keep going without feeling discouraged? Andrew, go for it. Yeah, I don't mean going first. I don't mind going first on this one. This is a really hard one because I think there are a couple couple categories or things to consider here. Not it's not just like a clear answer. The first category is that um you never want to try the same strategy twice, usually, right? So, you know, you don't want to do the same thing 10 different times and just expect, you know, a different answer. Um and I mean that in, in the true sense of the words, like it's possible your approach isn't matching up with what they're looking for. Maybe you have the experience and the way you've talked about it is not matching up with them. Not that you don't have the experience, but you're just not matching up. So if you're getting multiple rejections for the same role, I really strongly consider you to, uh, to encourage you to take a moment and just stop doing the same thing and try something different. I don't know what that different approach looks like depending on your, your situation, but I think all the tools we talked about earlier would help. And think about concretely all those rejections you've had. Are you using the same approach? Maybe you are changing your approach and you're still not finding success. In that case, I think you can look at the specific places you're applying to, maybe the specific classification. Maybe you should try applying to a different sort of class classification. Maybe you should think about a different level at the sense. I think sometimes we get really stressed out about what our career should look like over time. And we think about like, okay, I should be applying to this level right now because I'm supposed to be that level by next year. And honestly, in reality, it's not necessarily like that. Again, this is like a long journey that we're all on, right? And sometimes taking a lateral move somewhere else might be in a place that has more opportunities. Maybe there's more acting assignments there. Maybe there's more promotional opportunities. So I would just say like those two categories of things, don't keep trying the same thing over and over expecting a different result. Really take some time to reflect on why your approach isn't working. Maybe it's something on your side. Maybe it's something on their side. I don't know which it is. But the second approach is just like, just think a little bit creatively about what opportunities exist for you. Maybe that's part of the reason you're seeing rejection and to just be open-minded about these different things. Sometimes a change can be really good for you for reasons that you didn't even think. Thanks. That was really insightful. And it just made me think of what's in our, that sphere of our control and what's in our control. And we can control the approach that we use, but not necessarily the outcome. So thank you, Jose. I, I really appreciated that point, Andrew, especially to your point too, Julia, about identifying what it, what we are able to do in order to move forward. One of the hardest lessons that I learned as I came into the public service was how promotions work. And as I'm sure some of you might know, others might not, in government, unlike other places outside of government, you, you, your employer isn't able to just move you up if you're doing, you know, if you're delivering really good work. There's a lot of factors that come in to whether their an employer has the ability to move you up a category. So including whether they actually have, they call the, the HR folks call these boxes, including the fact, including whether your organization has a box to put you in. If they don't, no matter how good you are, no matter how well you perform, they can't, they, they, there aren't, the mechanisms aren't there for you to be promoted per se. So to Andrew's point, lateral moves can be really beneficial in finding other opportunities, especially if you're feeling, if you're in a position where you're feeling stuck. So really, really recommend, you know, broadening those horizons. 
And of course, there are so many other factors. The size of the organization can sometimes affect the opportunities. For example, where I work, the Canadian Digital Service, we're fairly small. We only have our teams around 160 folks in comparison to some of our other team, other teams in the department that are like 500, 600, size can enable you to find more opportunities in that branch division department. And so don't take it as, don't take that lack of mobility as a result of your actions or your fault. Rather, think about it in perspective and see if it really truly is as something being, at some, as it being something out of your control. I'm really glad you brought that up, Jose, because it kind of speaks to that that earlier point I mentioned of it's not, you know, you could experience rejection internally if you want to stay at your team, but you're you're not being, you know, moved up. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, just to, I'm glad you brought that up, Julia. I'm going to connect it back to what Jose was saying, how to ask your manager about kind of feedback on why or why not you were considered for an acting assignment or something like that. Even short-term things like a week or a couple of weeks, right? These things matter. These experiences help people get ahead in their careers. So the first thing I would say is that like um, managers might differ in how comfortable they are in providing transparency. Unfortunately, it's not across the board. Managers are willing to give you information, but the best way to approach it is not to be combative and demand these answers and say you deserve this opportunity. You're 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 just shocked you didn't get it. You know you're going to have way more success if you, like Jose said, be curious, provide a curious lens to your question and say you're really just looking to to identify areas that are improvement for yourself. Constantly trying to develop in your career and learn from your setbacks and kind of limitations. What are the things you think I should develop further to be considered for this kind of role in six months or in a year? Let's identify them. Let's put them in my performance management agreement. Let's track them. What are the opportunities I can do to get experience doing those things? So I'm ready for this in the future. Approach it like that and you're way more likely to find success. Thank you. I'm just keeping an eye on time. So maybe perhaps we'll just move to the next question if that's all right. Um, this one comes from Stephanie. Uh, it's a bit of a tricky one. I think it goes back to the spheres we were talking about, but how does one navigate budget cuts or, you know, when tight, you know, fiscal environments as the reason for rejection? Yet like job postings are are still open. So they're still there, but they're um they're they're not actually, I guess, filling those positions. Yeah, Andrew. Um, first of all, this is going to be more and more likely the case given the restraints TBS has announced and maybe more are coming with the new budget. Um, so this is a great question. Um, the first of which is like, I wouldn't take this as a confusing thing that like, oh, I should have gotten this job, but the budget isn't there and the posting is still there. Likely that's just some kind of like administrative thing that's just the posting is still there, but they don't have the funding for it and they can't give it to you or they can't give it to anyone else. However, to maximize your opportunities, you can ask them, are there any similar jobs in your organization or your branch that are ongoing right now that I might uh, be uh, considered for? Um, are there any other kind of uh, similar opportunities that exist, um, might exist in the future that might not exist right now? Do you mind putting them on my radar, given my interest in this role? Um, and just apply for as many as possible. Don't just, this is a little thing that I think of as a researcher, right? Like, don't just apply to public health because you have a public health background. Apply to several different places doing similar type of work that you might be doing in public health. Expand your horizons, expand your opportunities. Public service is amazing. You can move around your whole career and learn tons of different things. So that's what I'd recommend. Thank you. And I'm so sad we're almost out of time, but any last minute comments to that questions or or any of the questions that um, we had today? Yeah, Jose. I'll take this as closing statements. Uh, I remember researching some time ago how rejection manifests physically in the body and researchers found that it activates the same part of the brain as 
the same part of the brain that experiences pain. And so I'll leave you with this, accept rejection as it being an, 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 an inevitable experience that's painful. And that's okay. It is a hard thing to process. There's no point in buttering and there's no point in framing it differently. But it is on you to find your way back to equilibrium and empower yourself again to bounce back. So I'll leave you with this. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Well, I'm going to sit on that one. Thank you. Taya, last comment. Well, gosh, it's really hard to say anything after that, Jose. Uh, that's the, the perfect closer. And I, I was just going to say a little tidbit that I think, too, if you're if you're not getting positions or whatever, I think that it's really important to track your accomplishments throughout your career as well. And so oftentimes we forget to do that because our work days are crazy busy. Um, but if you put like time, a time block in your calendar so that, you know, at the end of two weeks or at the end of a month, you have an hour set aside in your calendar where you can go through everything you accomplished during that time and have it be like a living document, a Google document or whatever it might be. So that when these jobs do come up, you're not forgetting about valuable experience that you have and that could potentially help you get those jobs. And that's one little thing but for some reason, it's really hard to do <laughs> unless I think you put it into your calendar and like allocate that time specifically. And uh, yeah, thanks. thank you. I'm so sorry, but we are really at time. I just want to thank like a big, big thank you to our panelists for joining us today, being vulnerable enough to share their experience. Um, an insight. And I want to thank Finn for hosting this session. You can revisit the learnings on the Finn YouTube page or check out the podcast series whenever questions arise. And if you want to know more about any topics brought forward today, check out the wiki resource page. Over to you, Finn team. Thank you. That's it for today, everyone. Actually, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for, to our wonderful panelists. We invite you all to continue joining the sessions. Check out the schedule on our wiki page, which has been posted in the chat. And we would love to see you at the kiosks today from 3.30 to 4.30 for kiosk visits and networking. There's quite a few of our wonderful GC communities who are here with us at the kiosks. And we will be visiting with them and you can come ask questions, network, meet people, all that great stuff from 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern time today, EST. And there's one more quick polling question. So if you don't mind, it's anonymous. Please feel free to give us your feedback. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful panelists for all your great advice. And thank you everyone for joining today. Take care.